This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. State lawmakers have yet to vote on a new two-year budget. Coming up, we focus on concerns from the parents of children and adults with intellectual or developmental disabilities. How will funding cuts impact services that exist in the community, such as day programs for individuals? We'll speak with parents and hear from the board president of the ARC Connecticut. First, a crisis has been developing in the ER in recent years, and this is not the first time we've talked about this issue on the show. Children with mental health issues are spending multiple nights in emergency departments. In some cases, we're not talking days, we're talking weeks. Are you a parent of a child with a a developmental disability who had nowhere to turn but the ER for help? How long did your child remain there before you were able to place him or her in a community setting? We want to hear from you today. That number, 860-275-7266. You can email where we live at wmpr.org. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. Now, we wanted to find out, you know, the problem and why it persists in ERs. And so we've invited Dr. Steve Rogers on the show. He's medical director of the Emergency Department's Behavioral Health Unit at Connecticut Children's Medical Center in Hartford. Dr. Rogers, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's hard to think about children going to the ER, but for a few near, for a few years now, as I mentioned in the intro, there's been attention on the fact that ERs are seeing more and more kids with developmental disorders or mental health issues coming into the ER. How big of a problem is this at, at, at Children's? Well, Connecticut Children's is actually the largest emergency mental health provider in the state, despite the fact that we are not a psychiatric institution. Um, and in fact... Uh, our numbers have grown, what I like to call exponentially, it may not be exactly that, but um, back in 2000, we saw about 600 patients a year with mental health chief complaints. Uh, this year, we expect to see probably closer to 3,500 patients. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that has grown disproportionately to any other um, chief complaint in our emergency department. And why, why that growth? Hard to say. Uh, probably a combination of increased awareness, um, maybe increased prevalence. It's, it's really difficult to, to make that determination uh, or, or just a perception that uh, the emergency department is a place to take your child when they have a mental health issue, which of course it is if they're in crisis and uh, need to uh, be evaluated for safety. That's absolutely the right place. Um, there are lots of great community services and state services that also provide uh, crisis services and mental health services in the community. Now, Dr. Rogers, your phone is going in and out, so hopefully oh, you can speak up a, a little bit more sure. uh, so our listeners can hear you. Um, but this, you know, when we're talking about uh, individuals, children with uh, mental health issues or they're having some kind of outburst and it's not safe for them anymore to be at home, you know, why is the ER not a good place? Walk us through, uh, obviously, th- this might be a, an obvious question, and then how ERs like at CCMC, how you've had to try to adapt the space to help these patients. Yeah, and like I said, you know, Connecticut Children's isn't alone in this. It's a national problem. We've actually just recently published a manuscript talking about the increased rates across the country. So it's not just Connecticut, and it's not just Connecticut Children's. It's emergency departments across the nation. Um, And yes, it is a place to bring your child if you feel they are unsafe. The difficult part for us is our focus in the past has always been on taking care of medical emergencies and including things like traumas and uh, you know typical illnesses uh, but we've had to adapt our unit in order to accommodate the uh, increased volume of mental health complaints uh, especially with safety issues so hit certain patients who are suicidal or are uh, potentially harmful to themselves and others need to be kept safe. And so when kids are out of control, it's difficult to do that in an emergency department setting. So you said you've had to adapt. Can you describe um, these safe spaces or safe areas uh, for these patients when there aren't enough beds and they need to be placed somewhere? Yeah, well, to start with, Connecticut Children's recognized the problem uh, years ago uh, and invested in a special section of rooms that we have that are what well, safe rooms I would say so they don't have things that kids can hurt themselves on like sharp objects or anything that it, we would call a ligature meaning they, they can't hang themselves on something or hurt themselves uh, reinforced walls enclosed TVs um, and we even have rooms that are 
um, convertible, we call that, meaning they have garage doors that cover all the medical equipment so that we can close that and make it a safe room for the patients that are potentially uh, or, at, or at high risk of hurting themselves or others. Um, but there are times that we exceed the number of rooms we have, and oftentimes we're seeing upwards of 20 to 30 patients in what's only about a 45-bed unit, um, which makes it difficult to keep these kids safe when we have to place them in hall beds. Um, and start to use the medical rooms as well. I wanted to bring into the the conversation now a Connecticut mother who uh, understands this problem uh, firsthand. Uh, Her name is Michelle Ahern. She lives in West Hartford. Uh, Michelle, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, I wanted to ask you a little bit if you could tell us about your son and your experience uh, when um, he's in crisis and you need to take him somewhere for help. What have you had to do? Um, t- well, I take him to the um, children's hospital. Um, he's been there quite a few times, um, but he had gotten so aggressive. Um, you know, he's only 13 and he's already six foot one. Um, he's he was there for 43 days, I believe. He left yesterday, um, and um, you know they they're just so wonderful for him. But it's it just. Nobody wants to help. None of the agencies want to help. They want to just switch it over to, you no, know, go to this agency. And basically, I was, they couldn't even really get him into another hospital um, because there's only three hospitals that take kids with autism. Um, and even in New Hampshire, where he's been three times, they, they wouldn't take him. Um, the hospital in Rhode Island had a uh, two month waiting list. and. He just spent three months at the new hospital, at the hospital for special care, but they rejected him five times. Um, So he was stuck there, and I couldn't take him home. Mm. Um, And so I just was fighting every agency I could until I got help. Now, Michelle, um, just to back up a little, did you say that your son was at within an emergency department for 43 days? 43 days, yes. He left yesterday. I mean, that just, it's, it's really, it sounds really shocking to think that your child has been uh, within an emergency department. Explain w- the, the process. So you take him to the ER, and um, they, the medical professionals agree with you that he can't go home. And so where was he? T- describe the space that um, he was in, and um, how did you navigate that? Well, what they typically do is try to place him. Um, and he's always, we never had a, um, a hospital in Connecticut, all to, I think uh, maybe a year ago, a year and a half ago. Um, so he's always gone to um, Hampstead Hospital in New Hampshire. Um, that was never an issue. He's, they know him, but this time around they said they weren't going to take him. So then, you know, they go to the next hospital and try to get him into there, but Rhode Island takes all their kids first. Um, and then they take out of um, state uh, children. Um, and then they were trying to get him back into the hospital he was just in, and they wouldn't take him. So, um, you know, in the midst of that, you know, um, I did apply for DCF volunteer. Um, voluntary services? Do- yep, yeah, voluntary services. We, we are on um, uh, DDS, uh, Department of Intellectual Disability. Um, but I got um, denied uh, a group home placement, which is really what he needs. He definitely needs that. Um, so then I was doing the appeal with that, which, you know, every day goes by. Um, and then nothing was really happening, so the hospital called DCF, which they should because I really did abandon my child. Um, but sadly to say... Uh, I didn't re- even get investigated. I have an investigator, but um, I never got investigated. Mm. So thank God um, things started to turn around, as I call the commissioner every day, and just started to keep pushing everywhere I could go. Michelle, you said that y- you, in a way, abandoned your son, but you're doing this because you need help. Correct. Yes. And so you said after 43 days, he's now being moved to the hospital for special care in New Britain because they have space for him? 
Um, well, thanks to Dr. Rogers um, and um, Dr. Uh, Momashar at Hospital for Special Care um, agreed to take him back. And the group home that he is going to be going to, um, the bed's opening up at the end of June. So as I'm fighting all these other people, <laughs> um, he did agree to take him back. Um, so Joshua went there yesterday, um, and he'll be there a couple weeks until we transfer him to the group home. This is where we live. Today we're talking about a, a, a problem that's been happening over the last few years, and that is uh, more and more children with mental health or behavioral issues, um, they're going to the ER. Their parents, their families have nowhere else to turn for help. On the phone with us, Michelle Ahern, a West Hartford resident. Uh, she's a mother of a son with autism. And also Dr. Steve Rogers, medical director of the Emergency Department's Behavioral Health Unit at Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Dr. Rogers, I'll turn back to you. So it sounds like a lot's being done to help these families navigate, if you could name three things that these families need in the community, what do they need, and what are the barriers to getting it? Oh, that's a tough one. Three wi- three wishes, huh? Um, so it's, the barriers are mostly financial, uh, if you really drill down into it, um, and it makes it really difficult. Uh, another huge barrier is just the complexity of the various systems in our state. We our state, fortunately for us, has lots to offer compared to others, uh, but many of those services are, are segmented or what we call siloed um, and not working necessarily in an integrated way. Um, so we're working on trying to fix that at Connecticut Children's. Uh, one of the things we've done in the emergency department is actually partner with our colleagues at the Office of Child Community Health um, and a service there called the Center for Care Coordination. So we provide uh, care coordination for children leaving the emergency department, and that's basically uh, a service that helps them connect to various community services, uh, and hopefully <clears throat> we can help them find the things they need, uh, and from our standpoint, hopefully avoid having to come back to the emergency department again. Um, but getting back to the three wishes, uh, I guess I would wish for Lots and lots of money. Um, I think the state budget cuts have made things even more difficult uh, for the various state services to provide the services they want to provide. Um, I would actually wish for lots and lots of hospital beds, um, but that's difficult to manage. Uh, and so, you know, you can if you don't need 500 beds a year, it's it's hard to keep something like that open when you only need it at certain times of the year. Um, but definitely having more services for uh, children with special needs would be great. Um, uh, and then I guess, uh, you know, also just uh, more services within the school system would be great as well. So uh, I think the schools struggle with this issue quite a bit. So that if there are more services in the schools that might help uh, alleviate some of these crises where people are getting connected to services, helping the parents a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I think the Department of Education and the school system struggles with this issue as well. You know, they they take care of our kids for a large portion of the day, um, and they're already overburdened with the many things that they have to do to meet their educational needs. Um, And so when you throw in mental health care needs, uh, it makes it even more complex and difficult. I want to take a call. Josh is calling from Hartford. Josh, you're on the show. Hi, thank you. I, I work for the Public Defender Agency here in Connecticut, and I specialize in child protection cases. So, these, you know, when when these families who have high needs kids come in contact with the Department of Children and Families, is when they come to me, and I'll either represent a parent or a child. And one of the things that I see a lot, and I'm just speaking for myself as a lawyer, not for my agency, is what Michelle and what Hartford said is that. It's hard to get the Department of Children and Families to move on teenagers who have these kind of problems because they're hard to place, they're complicated, they're expensive. And I think that there's uh, budget pressure on DCF. And I mean, I, for example, I represent a family, my mother right now, whose child had, was 13, very much like what Michelle said, is, is, is 13 is bigger than his mom. Uh, has repeated violent outbursts, and he'll always go briefly to the emergency room, then he gets stabilized, then he goes home. And 
DCF doesn't have a bed. They can't figure out where to put him. They actually wanted to close the case, and they would have, but for the fact that he had another violent outburst and went back to the hospital. So it's something that happens again and again, and it's it's hard to see the way out of it. Well, Josh, thank you for your perspective. I'll turn back to Michelle because, uh, Michelle, you mentioned that um, your son needs a group home placement. There aren't enough of those in Connecticut. Um, How concerned are you in terms of you say he's going to be going to the hospital for special care in New Britain, but when does when does that time, when, when that ends up uh, being finished, where will he go next? Um, he did, um, we did work out a deal um, with, um, so that he is going to be able to go uh, to the group home, which we, we've been, um, we've had Oak Hill services and home supports for five years now, which the um, you know the the staff that he attacked at our trained staff. Um, so it is an Oak Hill group home, and it's just perfect for him because it's, it's this very rigid house. Um, there's boys 13 through 20, um, and there's an opening, which is like very hard to find. Um, so that's where he's going to be going um, on the 30th. Well, Michelle, it we, took a long time to get there. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you, what's your advice to other families who are dealing with the same issues? You just got to keep persisting till you can find a place for your child. Yeah, I, I I'm pretty persistent. I I'm not going to quit on my son and what he needs. And I haven't even dealt, even thought about dealing with the emotional piece of you know he's a twin, and I'm a single parent, and to just think that my son is not going to be here. I can't even go there yet. So emotionally, that's a whole different story. But um, yeah, to to not give up. And and I write every number down I can get. And I, I just contact every single person I can get a number for. Well, Michelle Ahern, West Hartford resident, a mother of a son with autism. Thank you for telling us a little bit of your story. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. And and Dr. Steve Rogers, Medical Director of the Emergency Department's Behavioral Health Unit at Connecticut Children's Medical Center. Dr. Rogers, you uh, said this earlier, but with the state's ongoing budget uh, problems, do you see the the numbers in the ER continuing to go up with these cases of of children patients? Yeah, it's been difficult. You know, uh, we we definitely see, we don't foresee a decrease in the numbers. Uh, We expect it to go up. I think the real telling part is we actually were able to, I looked at some data yesterday, and in fact, children with pervasive developmental disorders, which autism is one of those diagnoses, um, we actually have seen an, a huge increase in their length of stay over the same time last year. It's almost doubled. Um, so that just speaks to the complexity of finding the correct placement in the community for these folks, or as, an, as we discussed, or as an inpatient as well. Um, so I think with budget cuts, it's going to get even more difficult. Yes, absolutely. Exacerbated by what's happening in Washington? Potentially, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. no no uh, good news here today, Dr. Steve Rogers, but we appreciate you uh, uh, showing uh, our listeners that this problem continues to persist uh, throughout the state, and we'll keep talking about it until we, uh, we hear that there's a, a solution. Dr. Rogers, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate you bringing attention to the issues. Coming up, we hear from advocates and family members of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. What programs and services could be eliminated or reduced in the next two-year budget that lawmakers are still working to pass? We want to hear from you, and we'll find out more after the break. You can join the conversation, 860-275-7266. This is where we live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. State lawmakers say they'll agree on a new two-year budget by the end of the month after they failed to agree during the regular legislative session that ended uh, earlier this month. All that waiting has consequences not just on state employees or town budgets, but on families that rely on support for a host of services. For the rest of the show, we're focusing on the concerns from families of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Cuts to programs is nothing new, but what's at stake this year? To help answer that question, Tom Fiorentino joins us in in studio. He's board president of the ARC Connecticut. Tom, welcome to the show. 
Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate your doing a show on this issue. It's vital. Thank you. And tell me, um, for people who don't know a lot about the Art Connecticut, who do you serve? We are the, uh, I think, preeminent statewide advocacy group uh, for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, our, uh, the state organization's focus is advocacy. Our chapters, which cover every corner of Connecticut, are actually direct service providers. So FAVAR, uh, the ARCA of New London, they're the people who are hands-on providing day and employment services as well as residential services. I wanted to, before we talk about uh, the programs that exist uh, today and what's at stake in terms of cuts, because no one knows yet uh, with uh, the budget negotiations still happening, but can you kind of give us a backtrack of, of what was available in the state back in the 80s? how that may have improved over the decades, and what we have today to help families that we're talking about. Well, there have been real ups and downs in what's available. Um, Connecticut historically uh, was in the vanguard of the states as far as how we addressed uh, the needs of people with, let's call it IDD for, for, uh, for short. Uh, but back then, that meant institutions. Uh, Many states have gotten out of the institution business. Connecticut is still in it. Um, Connecticut was one of the first uh, states to really get into group homes. But while group homes are absolutely appropriate for some, they overserve many and at a uh, significantly higher cost than more integrated community placements. Talk a little bit more about what you're saying. They overserve many. So what do you mean? Yeah, so there are folks, a group home is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week setting where uh, the individuals who live there basically are in a, in a fairly regimented routine. Uh, you eat together, you eat the same things, you do the same activities by and large, although the day part, the day programs can vary. Um, that, when you are staffed up 24-7, uh, the costs are going to be substantial. And the fact of the matter is, is that there are folks in those placements now who can, who can live happily, safely, uh, uh, and quite frankly, more economically, more integrated in the community, in their own apartments, uh, in their own condos, sharing space with even folks who don't have disabilities. So our, our, our concern is when you overserve some, and by overserve I mean spend more money uh, per person than you, than, than you really ought to, you're going to underserve others, especially in this budget uh, environment. So we've got about 2,000 people on a waiting list for residential services. When we see people who can, and in other states do, function very effectively, more integrated into to, to less restrictive community placements, what we're saying is, hey, why don't we rebalance in Connecticut? Now, when you're talking about uh, these decisions, those decisions are made by the Connecticut Department of Devel Developmental Services, DDS? To a certain extent. But, you know, I want to uh, make it clear. There's new leadership at the Department of Developmental Services, and I think it's good leadership and creative leadership. But they can only do what they're authorized to do, uh, both in terms of uh, the amount of money that they get and how they're directed to spend that money. So I, I think that there's a conversation going on now with the folks at DDS and elsewhere in the state government to try and shift Connecticut to a more, quite frankly, progressive uh, approach to serving people with IDD. And that more progressive approach means integrated into the community. You mentioned new leadership. That's the, the new commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Developmental Services, Jordan Sheff. We did invite Commissioner Sheff on today's show. A spokesperson declined saying the commissioner would be available to talk after the legislature approves the budget. <laughs> so we look forward okay. to that conversation. Right. But we wanted to, you know, again, uh, talk a little bit more about the program specifically that um, are – that could face elimination or sure. or drastic reduction. So walk us through some of these. Um, you mentioned that Connecticut, um, you know, still has an institution. I believe you're talking about Southbury Training School. We have Southbury and a couple of regional centers also, correct. And so that's been controversial in the past about whether to close them. And why is it still open? Well, there's a certain amount of inertia. Uh, there's a certain amount of uh, uh, the interests of the folks who work there. Uh, understandably, uh, are, are part of the equation. 
Um, but the fact of the matter is last year, uh, Connecticut spent uh, almost $100 million to care for about 267 folks at Southbury Training School in as segregated a setting as you can imagine, which flies in the face of U- U.S. Supreme Court. It doesn't violate. I want to make that clear. But the, the spirit of the uh, Olmstead de- decision of the Americans with Disabilities Act is that people should be served uh, as integrated in the community as they can be. And the analysis of the folks at Southbury is the overwhelming majority can be served in the community. So when you spend almost $100 million uh, to take care of 267 people, it is going to have an effect, a dramatically adverse effect on your ability to serve others. And it has. So why is it still open? I don't know. Uh, there are 12 states uh, in the District of Columbia uh, who have eliminated institutions a, because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and when I say the right thing to do, every study ever done of an institutional closing reveals the same thing. The folks who have moved into the community function better, higher level. Their quality of life improves. And I am not saying that they are mistreated or in any way abused. This, though, is that scientifically, the right thing to do is to move to the community because people are better off. And interestingly, the families who absolutely understandably oppose closing, as you go out a year, three years, five years, say the same thing. Had we known then what we know now, we wouldn't have opposed this. Mm. So our leaders need to look at the evidence and make their decisions based on that. And uh, hopefully they will. This is where we live today. We're uh, focusing on the concerns of families uh, with adult children that have intellectual developmental uh, disabilities. Um, If you're one of them, you wonder about the program that your son or daughter um, is in now, whether it's a day program or a a group home, we want to hear from you too, 860-275-7266. So we talked a little bit about Southbury, why it's still open. What are some specific programs that are slated to that may be reduced significantly in this uh, budget when it happens? Right. Every year, uh, from Connecticut uh, public schools, about th- let's say about 350, n- there are about 350 new graduates with IDD, and traditionally they have gone into uh, what are called day and employment programs. This is work. These are other programs that build on what these young people uh, have learned uh, in school from ages three basically to 21. This year's proposed budget from the governor eliminates all funding for those new graduates for two years. So that's about 700 people who will graduate from their public schools to nothing. That means in some cases, a parent is going to have to quit their job to stay home. Uh, But more tragically, it means that everything that those young people have uh, really striven to to achieve now uh, counts for nothing because they are not going to be in their community. They're going to be maybe in front of a TV uh, or otherwise not moving forward to integration into the community. And it makes some parents wonder, what was this whole battle I went through in school for my child to get them the educational programming they need uh, for if at the end of it, they're going to be home? So that cut, we hope, will be reversed. But as of today, uh, that is part of the governor's budget. So 700 people uh, graduate to nothing. In addition, in your your prior segment, you were talking about emergency room uh, admissions for folks with uh, uh, IDD, autism, and so on. A a key preventive uh, program for that is something called the Behavioral Services Program. And that allows DDS to fund programs uh, for young people, children, adolescents in their homes who have IDD but also have these behavioral problems, emotional disturbances, and so on. Well, the budget cuts a substantial amount of that program, which is going to create a waiting list for that. So that's the, 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 the ounce of prevention being worth a pound of cure. If you can address these issues before they explode, you're going to save money. And, 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 and saving money is great and everything, but it also think about the toll on the family 
to have these meltdowns and repeatedly go into the emergency room. It, it, it's really, you know, it's, it really is tragic and, and it's avoidable. So cutting that, it just to us makes no sense. Now, on the flip side, Tom, yeah. play the devil's advocate. State faces $5 billion deficit. The lawmakers are still working on this budget that supposedly will happen before the end of the month. What what can they do? Well, what we've su- suggested uh, <laughs> with increasing vigor is that they need to rebalance this system. Other states are serving more people with fewer dollars because they are doing it uh, in a more, again, integrated in the community way. So, for example, back to our group home discussion er- earlier on, if you're spending $100,000 on someone in a group home who can be served in their own apartment with staff at $40,000 a year, why wouldn't you do that? But we don't do that. We are stuck. We, the, 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 the inertia is very, very difficult. We have always approached this problem, Lucy, recognizing the budget as kind of a zero-sum game. Right, so how can you use existing appropriations to do more? Uh, and we, I, there are ways to do it, and, and, and you don't have to invent anything because states bordering us, like Massachusetts, are already doing it. You know, another thing that uh, just a really important program that the governor has proposed cutting is something called Community First Choice. Community First Choice was part of, or is part of, the Affordable Care Act. It's part of Medicaid expansion. We were petrified in March that the Congress was about to repeal the Affordable Care Act and Community First Choice, which has gotten about 200 people with IDD off of the waiting list and done it in an incredibly efficient way. It's a tough, kind of Spartan-like program. We were concerned they were going to get rid of it. Now, that hasn't happened yet. But in the most recent budget proposal in May, the governor has suggested the complete elimination of that highly efficient program that has thrown a lifeline to hundreds of families. So we are in the process of, <laughs> of opposing that as vigorously as we can. We think it was a uh, not the right decision to make, and we hope they'll reconsider that. You're hearing Tom Fiorentino, board president of the ARC Connecticut. This is an advocacy group for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. You can join the conversation on Where We Live, 860-275-7266. I wanted to bring into the conversation some parents who are navigating the system. Uh, Velma Williams Estes is on the phone. She lives in Meriden. She's a caregiver for her adult daughter with Down syndrome. Velma, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you this morning? I'm doing well. Thank you for calling in today. Tell us about your daughter. Well, uh, my daughter is 49 years old, will soon be 50 in December, and she is she's just a beautiful person. <laughs> and uh, she lives at home with me, uh, just the two of us. I'm widowed. Uh, she attends a, an adult day program in North Haven uh, every day, which is which is a very fortunate thing. We're blessed for that, and I hope that can continue. And um, she does have access to respite care approximately two times a year, and that is her support services that she's uh, receiving at this time. Mm. So you're worried with the, the new budget that you're worried about this day program that she goes to, that that will be eliminated? Or tell me I, a little bit more. I'm worried about everything because everything is up in the air. You really don't know what to uh, surmise what will happen. You just don't know what to think. Uh, I am really worried. Um, I am part of a advocacy group, Our Families Can't Wait, uh, one of the steering committee members. Um, what we do, we advocate for all the services that are needed by all people with IDD. Uh, it's just not an individual thing. Uh, we focus a lot on the residential services and, and other necessary services that each individual, you know, person would need and are not receiving. And I went into this advocacy group because I became very scared about what was going to happen to my daughter should something happen to me. I'm her sole caregiver, and, you know, I don't have in-home supports or anything like that at this time, but I would love to make sure that they would be available if needed. 
and that has been my whole point. I haven't even uh, been seeking residential services. I just need to prepare for that. I would love to make sure that that transition for her would be really good, and I wouldn't have that worry that she would be just dumped anywhere because she needs um, 24-7 care. Uh, she needs someone with her at all times. She, she, her vocabulary is very limited. Uh, she doesn't read, write, or she doesn't understand um, danger. Uh, these are things that you really have to be with her, keep an eye on her at all times. She's never left alone. Mm. Velma, you raised some good points. I wanted to turn back to Tom Fiorentino, board president of the Art Connecticut. Uh, Velma raised the point that her daughter is almost 50. Velma's getting older. She worries about where her daughter will, will go. If there's this huge wait list, 2,000 people waiting to be in these group homes, what's the answer for Velma? Well, I share with Velma that concern. I'm a parent of a 26-year-old uh, young man with Down syndrome. Uh, but we all, aware of our fallibility, at least most of us, <laughs> uh, realize that at some point we're not going to be there to provide the care um, that's needed, and it keeps you up at night. The state of Connecticut's official, well, de facto policy is um, you will not get a placement until the last caregiver is either dead or permanently disabled. That is the policy that the progressive state of Connecticut has. So. How do we approach that? I think that part of the solution is delivering services in a different way. There needs to be a continuum of care. And for some folks, 24-7 group homes uh, are, make sense. For other folks, they don't. Many other states have integrated their folks with IDD into the community at a, at a, in, in a far more efficient way. And I want to go back to the com yeah, I think that the community benefits when people with IDD, uh, I'm sorry, the people with IDD obviously benefit when they're integrated into the community, but the community also benefits from having these folks in it. Mm -hmm. My son brings joy and happiness uh, to those he meets. Uh, he works three days a week uh, in a dermatologist's office in Bloomfield, Dr. Penoyer, who's a wonderful physician who took, I guess, a chance on our son. Uh, he has something to add, and a lot, our, our folks have something to add. They need to be there. They are a part of us, and we are all strengthened, like every civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And what we are in is the civil rights movement for integration and acceptance uh, and a place in the community. The community initially says, well, we're going to be worse off, right? We don't want it. Well, look, we've heard that for hundreds of years. In, 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 before we had in the United States, we heard that. Uh, we're not going to accept that people need to go into the community. And I think that if you take the resources we have and allocate them according to need, you'll be able to serve far more people and I think make a dent in this waiting list. I wanted to bring up, uh, there have been some movement of where some of these group homes, they're privatized to save money. Yeah. Is that something the Art Connecticut supports? Uh, uh, Janice from Facebook writes, privatization sounds great, but after a few years, uh, the employees get, let's, get lots less money to provide services. Private pay is horrible, like a revolving door for staffing. Well, a couple of things. You have to look at this from the, uh, again, if we can use facts in studies, there is no difference in the quality of care uh, provided by much higher paid state employees and those who work in the private sector. That's one thing. Number two, she's absolutely right. They are underpaid. Part of the result of the system we have now where so much money is taken by those who are receiving care uh, in the state system, the state meaning uh, care uh, delivered by state employees, there's not enough to pay a living wage to the folks who work for these private providers. So um, it does create staff turnover, which is a problem. But when you are rebalancing, one of the things I think you need to do is have a, as one of your things that you need to address is the wages of the folks in the private sector need to come up. And I think you can do that and serve more people, but we've got to get out of the system we're in now. This is where we live. I want to take uh, one more call before we head to break. Uh, Doug is calling from Weston. Doug, we have a couple minutes. Go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Doug. I've, I've listened to your program. 
Uh, you brought up a few minutes ago the issue of kids that are aging out of high school. And indeed, my daughter is having her last day of high school on Tuesday. Um, she has been accepted to a wonderful program in Weston at St. Catherine's School, but there is no funding. And so as of Tuesday, uh, for the foreseeable future, she will need to be cared for at home five days a week, which means uh, work can't get done, uh, jobs may be lost, certainly in our family. Um, but the consequences of that are far-reaching. Unfortunately, I certainly understand the difficulty the state has with the budget, and all of these issues and all of these places that funding is needed are compelling and, and tug at the heartstrings, and I don't know the answer. Um, I do know that ending this program for, I think you said, the 700 kids, I thought it was fewer, but ending this program, um, if indeed it is ended, impacts families, not just the child involved, but impacts families in a far-reaching way. Um, single parents will not be able to, to both work and care for their child. Uh, families will not be able to have the income they need to survive. Um, and it's a, it's a very difficult situation. Well, thank you, Doug, for uh, sharing a little bit about uh, your uh, your story. Uh, this is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today, we're hearing from families and advocates for Connecticut residents with intellectual and developmental disabilities. They're worried about cuts to programs that help their sons, their daughters. As lawmakers and the General Assembly still work to meet a June 30th deadline to agree on a new two-year budget. We're going to hear from more of these families after the break. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're talking with parents of adult children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Since the start of the legislative session in January, they've been bracing for deep cuts to services and programs, with news about a $3 billion deficit. The news got worse. Now lawmakers have to plug a $5 billion hole, and they're still working on that budget. What services does your loved one with developmental disabilities receive in the community? What would be the impact if they lost that program? We have a couple more families on the line. I want to uh, join, uh, ask Laura uh, Fusi to join in on the conversation. She's a Milford resident, and she's the mother of an adult daughter with autism. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Tell us about your daughter and the services that are helping her. Um, right now, my daughter, um, she has a dual diagnosis of intellectual disability and autism, and she attends a day, a day support program, um, and it's from 8.45 in the morning till about 3.15 she gets home. And um, it's a great community-based program. She receives um, work on her daily living skills, her independence skills, uh, a little bit of academic, social um, communication skills, and she's somebody who cannot be left alone at all. Um, she, um, because of her communication difficulties, we don't really know how much she understands. Um, you can t- say the same thing to her in two different ways, and she'll answer two different, the, the responses will be two different responses from her. And we don't know about stranger danger for her. Um, it She's a subject of somebody who can be a real target for a predator. Um, she has abilities. She is a, a, she's very independent in many ways, but her, her safety is paramount for us. Mm. Now, Laura, we heard from a caller before the break, uh, Doug, um, who says that without um, a day program, they're not sure, like, what can be done in terms of who's going to care you for her? Someone's going to have to stay at home, um, not be able to work. Is that the situation you would be in? Um, my family's fortunate. Um, if but if Jessica was home, I'd have to take care of her. I work part time now. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have the job that I have to be able to be there for her. Um, I know that I know single parents that would be in an t- untenable situation if they had to give up their jobs or use part of their salary to take care of their child. Um, I know of families whose children's are, children are leaving the school system and they have nowhere to go. And that is, it's a crime. It's, we've been investing so many dollars, taxpayer dollars, on educating these young men and women to become independent as possible, to be contributors to our community, to be a part of our community, and they'll be sentenced to isolation and being less than they should be productively, and they'll they'll decline. 
and it'll be an undue burden on the families that have to care for them. And Laura, you know, we're we're talking about this this big challenge before state lawmakers, this five billion dollar hole. What is realistic, given uh, the fiscal future here? I think that we have to look at answers in raising revenue. I think that some of the wealthiest people in our state can do with a few less tax breaks. I think that we have to look at maybe an easy pass system in terms of the the numbers of cars using our roads we do not we do not tax any of the people who come through our state um i think that we have to approach it and look at at dds it it's an advocacy agency for adults with developmental disabilities and the whole essence of their 5 year plan is basically to cut those services one of their one of their proponents is saying um they're going to to provide high quality supports to as many individuals as possible they want people to go to work they want people you know with people who are are not able to work to be in competitive work um opportunities with typical people um i think that we have to um ask our legislators and our governor and the dds system to provide a plan a long-term sustainable plan for services and funding for the DDS clients and i think that we have to ask our society what obligations do we have to provide the basic human needs for those who can't care for themselves well laura if you see thank you so much for telling us a little bit about your daughter and sharing uh, your perspective again she's a milford resident also velma williams estes a meriden resident who's the caregiver for her adult daughter with down syndrome we just have a couple minutes left i want to turn back to tom fiorentino board president of the arc connecticut uh, tom you must be bracing for the worst what are you telling your clients well we're telling them that we are up there fighting for them but they need to help us they need to contact their legislators and let them know that these cuts aren't acceptable to them. Um, they need to let them know that um, they think there's a better way forward because there is a better way forward. You know, we're we're sort of trapped in this very pessimistic cycle, aren't we, in Connecticut? All we hear is things are bad and the news is things are going to get worse. We need to kind of inspire people. And you don't inspire people that way. You inspire people by telling them there's a way forward. There is a way forward here. There are better ways to use the money that DDS gets, even with the cut appropriation, that can serve many more people. There is a way to do it. But you can't start with the assumption that there is no way to do it, that the only thing we can do is kind of like, you know, put our heads down and, you know, wait, you know, for what, right? So... We need to advocate and we need to tell legislators that there is a way to use the money that they've already appropriated in a better way and it can serve more people. Well, Tom Fiorentino, uh, board president of the ARC Connecticut, we appreciate you coming in today it's to been my pleasure. Uh, explain a very complicated issue. It is. And it, has, it, it didn't uh, come up overnight. It's not going to go away overnight. So we will look forward to speaking with you again in the future. And we will extend another invitation to the new commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Developmental Services, Jordan Sheff, to come on the show to answer some of these questions from our listeners. But we appreciate your time today, Tom. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Our show is produced by Lydia Brown and Jeff Tyson. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. Special thanks to WNPR intern Tim Cohen for answering the phones. WNPR's executive producer is Katie Tolarski. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. You can go to WNPR.org slash where we live for more about this show. You can download our show on any podcast app. As always, thanks for listening.